Good morning and welcome to today's CAST webinar, Virtual Field Trips for Mystic Seaport Museum. My name is Rosie O'Brien Wojtek and I'm the Assistant Executive Director for the Connecticut Association of Schools. This is going to be a really fun, exciting and informative webinar as we visit some of the exciting exhibits at Mystic Seaport that you and your students can see and learn about without leaving your school. Mystic Seaport is one of my favorite attractions in Connecticut, so I know that we're in for a treat, so I'm glad you're joining us today. I can't wait to get our tour started, but before we do, I would like to thank our corporate partners, Justin's, Horace Mann, Liberty Bank, the Connecticut Army National Guard, Pullman and Cumley, Connecticut Lighting Center, and the Department of Health for helping to make this webinar possible. We thank them for their continuing support of CAS Professional Development Webinars for all principals and educators in Connecticut. And again, we're excited to bring you this webinar and glad that you're joining us today. As a reminder, this session will be recorded and posted on the CAST website so you and your staff can view it later and you can share it with your colleagues and friends. Um, please use the chat feature or as Sarah has um, graciously um, said, let's just open our mics and go ahead and have a conversation while we're here today. So again, we're so excited to be here virtually at the Mystic Seaport Museum to learn about a variety of virtual field trips available to teachers and students this year. Our tour guides have selected some of the highlights of the museum to showcase for us so we get to see firsthand what it looks like, sounds like, and feels like to be at Mystic Seaport on a virtual field trip. As I said at the beginning, I love Mystic Seaport. There's so much to see and do and learn whenever I visit the museum. So enough talking from me, let's get this tour started. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you once again, our lead tour guide, Sarah Cahill for this adventure. Sarah is the Director of Education at Mystic Seaport Museum. Thank you for inviting us today, Sarah, and for letting us take this virtual tour and learn more about what's available for schools at the museum, as well as some of the grant funding available to make these virtual field trips happen. Ahoy there, Sarah, and take it away. Great. So what I'm going to do, the best way to, I, I feel, of course, is to just do it. So in a minute, we're going to showcase uh, two different types of our virtual programs. Um, but just very quickly, uh, you know, you may or may not have had a chance to, in the uh, wonderful write-up that Rosie sent in the email there, she did include a link to our document that um, describes all of our virtual programs. So interestingly, Mystic Seaport Museum, technically we've been doing virtual programs for several years um, but on a very small scale. Um, and of course, with COVID, we had to change very quickly. So starting last spring, almost right away, we switched as fast as we could. You know, like many places, unfortunately, everybody was downsized and we lost a lot of staff. But with a, a core group, we, we did a lot of virtual programs, which were, for the most part, a planetarium based. Um, Brian was, was the lead on that. Um, but then over the summer, we were able to really refine and expand our virtual field trip offerings because we realized 2020, 2021 would be a mostly all virtual field trips. So what we really had to do was take our two most popular field trips, Life in a Seaport Town and Whaling, and turn those into virtual, which we did. So you'll see part of the Life in a Seaport Town uh, virtual field trip today. So we really have two categories. We have a maritime history and primary source category, and we have an astronomy planetarium category. So those are two. And within those, we have, I think, 12 maritime history uh, options and nine planetarium options. And they're all on that document, which was in the email that Rosie sent. And if anybody needs it after, I'm happy to share it again. Um, and what we do, so the planetarium one, you'll actually see Brian do one a little bit later. But for the life in a seaport town and whaling, which you're about to see, we have three elements, which is how we hope to make a virtual program as interactive as possible because nothing beats being here. You know, it sort of kills us not to have the kids, but if we can't have them here, um, we do three different things. We actually have an educator on the grounds live from the exhibits and you'll see that. I don't know if you guys, you'll see Barb, we, we ended up investing in this um, iPad with a holder it turned, we tried so many different things. It turned out to be the best way to actually film these um, live Zoom virtual field trips. And that's the thing, they're, they're all live. There's a lot of back and forth. We try to make a lot of back and forth. The uh, another uh, second element is we actually have some pre recorded video, which you'll see, um, which is showing some of the exhibits alive that they couldn't actually you know, have seen otherwise. And then the final piece is I'll switch here. I have a, another webcam, we call it our artifact camera. We actually can do some primary source analysis and show some artifacts 
um, and, and, and we'll show you an example of one of those. So we're going to try to show you a very condensed version of our life in a seaport town with those elements highlighted. Then there's going to be a, a little, um, little break where I show you another part of another, the whaling program, and then Brian's going to show you part of the planetarium one. So since <laughs> such a small group, what we do with bigger school groups, uh, we always have a moderator. I'm playing the moderator role today. So we always encourage, especially with a bigger group, uh, using the chat for questions. I'm sure you all have experienced this, right? Um, and the moderator's role is to make sure that they monitor the chat, both to get the Q&A correctly and the rhythm going, also to make sure that it's an appropriate use of the chat. We love making teachers co-hosts because if they ever want to, sometimes they'll ask us, and we'll say, yes, please. So we'll make teachers co-hosts so that they can help with the chat moderation. That was when, for the most part, kids were all virtual. Now, as you all know, with transitioning back into school, what we do with virtual field trips is all the teacher has to make sure is that they, can, they just can project us up onto their smart board or somehow in the front of the room. And so what we do, it, it does make Q&A a teeny bit more complicated, but it's very doable. We tell them ahead of time okay, we're gonna have certain breaks for questions and we're gonna tell you. During that break, we will let the, let the teacher, the kids will be in the classroom and raise their hand. The teacher can do one of two things. They can have the student walk up to the microphone on the laptop and relay the question themselves, which has been working just fine. Or the teacher will relay the question just right there because they're sitting next to the laptop usually. Um, so that that's a, just a bit of logistics in terms of how these would happen from the classroom side. Um, oh, I should mention, we do have grant funding. We've been really lucky that our donors who used to give us money to offset the cost for in-person said, yes, of course, you can now use that to offset the cost of virtual programs. And the good news for you all is the virtual programs cost way less than an in-person -per in visit, but don't tell anyone that. No, I'm kidding. Um, and so uh, we, we can definitely provide up to 100% grant funding if need be. So, and each program costs $225. And we say, um, we, our Zoom account does hold 500 people, but we recommend no more than 100 at most, just for the quality of the experience. We, are, we have pushed it a few times and it's okay, but um, so we've had schools combine grades like They'll do a one program for their entire seventh grade. It's very efficient, so, you know. Or we've had if it's a bigger seventh or eighth grade, we do four program, four of the same programs on four different dates. You know, whatever works. We we really are willing to make it work. Okay, too much logistics at the beginning. Sorry. Let's get to the action here. Um, uh, we are going to let me share my screen because I, I want to show you what the beginning of a life in a seaport town. Uh, program would look like. So I need to optimize. Um, so you'll see the opening screen here. Well, you should, but it's not working, is it? Huh? Let me try that again. I apologize. And now you're getting to see um, sometimes the uh, problems that happen. Ha! Huh. My apologies. You know what we're going to do, Brian? Let's actually just start with you and Barb right in the box. So what you do normally with the opening is you'll just see the same slide I just showed you. It's a nice aerial overview of the grounds. And then uh, we turn it right over to our educators in the first stop. So I turn it over to Brian and Barb. Awesome. Sarah, thank you so much. So, um, yes, I'm coming to you all live here uh, from the inside of the Buckingham Hall House. This is where our virtual life in a seaport town tour begins, because the goal of this program, and that would be mentioned on one of those uh, introductory slides, the goal of this program is to talk about the connections of why coastal communities are going to spring up in the 1800s here in New England and really all along the shore. So this tour is gonna to take us to a number of different stops, but where better to start talking about life in the 1800s than here at home. So we're starting off here in what would be a children's bedroom. One of the things we often like to do with our students is we ask them for their observations. What do they see that looks familiar to them? What do they see that's a little bit out of place? that maybe they wouldn't find in their own bedroom. Um, kids are often surprised to find that as many as five children would have shared this one space. For any students who have siblings, that's a fun uh, thing for them to imagine. 
but we'll talk about the main bed, the trundle bed. We might think of bed curtains as being a fancy accessory, but they were a lot more commonplace back then, used for everything from holding warmth in the bed to blocking out the light. And so there are some fun connections to make between bedrooms of old and bedrooms of today. Um, during that pan across, you might have noticed a little chamber pot at the foot of the bed. That's always a fun conversation for kids because we don't ever see a bathroom. We don't get to talk about indoor plumbing. And so we inevitably lead to the conversation about uh, the chamber pot. But we also enjoy doing the compare and contrast. And so once we're done here in the children's room, Right next door, we have another bedroom where the grown-ups would have slept. So we'll follow a quick trip down the hall here. And we'll step into yet another room. And now we get to sort of do the compare and the contrast. The bed is a little bigger. We've got all the paint on the walls. This room is perhaps a little bit quieter. We don't see uh, any toys lying around, although Everybody always observes that this room is a little bit bigger. Our city about the things that you make, whether it be clothes or curtains. There's a lot of things that you are doing here at home. And then, of course, there are the things you're going to be relying on your community to provide. And so... That's why it's a great place to start here in the house. And you're getting the very sped up version of this. We would normally spend a lot more time interacting in these rooms. Um, to give you the full experience, we're gonna go down the steep stairs here. So you'll get to see one of the more visually interesting uh, parts of the tour. And uh, Ryan and <laughs> Barb, oh, there you are. So Barb, just to let you know, you guys are, your bandwidth is a little low. So after you're done with, uh, just double check the, uh, the MiFi connection, yeah. Great, okay. All right. And so we then come down into the living room and we talk about the types of activities that might have gone on in this space. Um, we certainly note that every room in this house has a fireplace, all connected to this one central heating source for the entire home. And then the main event I think in this house is to go into the kitchen. And the kitchen is just through the next doorway. And this is where we get to really make some interesting then and now connections. Um, if we happen to be here on a day when the museum is open, then there is a fire in the hearth. There's an interpreter who is cooking, but oftentimes we will improvise and do our own sort of tour through the kitchen. Um, this is a neat opportunity to ask students what's missing that they're used to seeing in their kitchen. We hear everything from refrigerators to sinks to stoves. And so we talk about the, the substitutes and how things were done, whether it's water from a well to fill up your sink or this wonderful hearth here that can provide a number of different cooking possibilities. So, Great. so Brian, we finish you our time. Yep, sorry to interrupt. I think what we'll do now is, as you all head over to the next stop, I'm going to actually play a video for them of the Buckingham Hall House so they can see it alive. Awesome. All right, so we will join Brian and Barb again at their next stop. But as they are heading over, this is sort of one of the other features I was talking about. Um, so I'm going to share my screen uh, so we can watch the, um, the video here. And this is... Um, a video of the Buckingham Hall House uh, that you just you, you just saw, but this one is actually talks a little bit more about it, um, and you can actually hear. Hi, my name is Alyssa. Welcome to the Buckingham Hall House at Mystic Seaport Museum. The Buckingham Hall House is the oldest home here at the Mystic Seaport Museum. When you come in to visit, you'll see people doing um, traditional open hearth cooking using original recipes from the time period. We use the herbs and the vegetables from our historic kitchen garden. It is all grown here and it's period appropriate. We cook seasonally, so we can only cook with what's available at this time of year unless you've preserved it. 
We here at the Mystic Seaport Museum will often use dried and salted codfish that we process here ourselves. So we split them here ourselves, we dry them and we salt them, and then uh, they'll last years until we decide to cook with them. You can see the difference between how you cook in your modern kitchen today versus um, 200 years ago. And after you talk with us a little bit, you'll find out it's not so different. We have a toaster, we have a rotisserie for the chicken called a reflector oven. Uh, we have a crane that we hang cast iron from. So we have most of the same things that you would have in your modern kitchen. You just have to adjust to the way you cook. I really love interacting with visitors. Every day you have different questions. People, some people are interested in the cooking itself. Some people are interested in the house. The most popular question is what happens with all the food uh, after we're done cooking it. Um, often the food will go to the staff break room at the end of the day, but we try and use as much of it as possible for future cooking. So if you made bread one day, you'll save it, you'll let it go stale, and then a week later you might make bread pudding. Great, all right, so that gives you an idea of, of, since the students can't actually be here in person, they can see it more. And actually sometimes if we're doing a virtual field trip when the museum is open, um, one of the educators in this case would have been Brian, he actually does do a back and forth with the interpreter in the kitchen. So um, we can do a, you know, an interaction like that as well. So, but we have the video too, just in case um, that, you know, the museum is actually not open. So uh, Brian and Barb have made their way to our second stop of the Life in a Seaport Town Tour. Yes, thank you, Sarah. So we are now at the, what we call the Stone Store. This is our general store here in the Seaport Town. And to connect to where we just were, you know, we talk about the Buckingham House with the home, the garden, they're making their own fabric, but sooner or later, there are certain things you just can't create on your own property. So where do you go? We've got our general store that provides everything from utensils you would use around the house to, in some cases, food products such as nuts or cheese or fruits. We've got some canned items here. And so now we're kind of talking about trade and how you get the things that you cannot make yourself. One of our favorite things to do in this exhibit that becomes one of those interactives is we play what is called the then and now game, where we take a hold of something a little on the older side from our collection, and we challenge students to give us the modern equivalent of that object. So I happen to have one right here hanging on the wall, We're nice and close. So I'm gonna grab this object off the hook here. And this is one of the items that we feature in our then and now game. It is a metal box with a oh, relatively short metal handle, nice little star pattern of holes in there. Um, and then of course we challenge the students. And, and Sarah, do you don't by any chance have the choices on the screen? Yes, she do does. Oh. <laughs> Even before you ask. I do. So now, um, you got off the hook here, participants, we need you all to uh, to guess for us what you think this actually is. So we're, you don't have to do it via the chat. Actually, in this case, you can just unmute and tell us if you think what Brian is showing you is a popcorn popper, an insect trap, or a foot warmer. I would say it's a popcorn popper. Okay. Mm -hmm. Have a vote in for that. Others? I also say popcorn popper. Okay. Anybody I, else? Yeah, I, I think agree. it's a foot warmer. Oh, 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 oh foot warmer. Oh, foot warmer. Way to be original. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Yeah. And so then we, we share with them the answer. Of course, we tell them that this is in fact an old time popcorn popper. And so this is one of those that is a little bit more familiar. Not to say that a foot warmer is say a bad answer, but we talk about how a foot warmer would most likely have a longer handle, the sort of thing where if you were holding hot embers, you would want to be able to hold those at quite an arm's length. And so one of the reasons why we might be steered towards a popcorn popper um, as a different possibility. So when you spend a little bit more time, again, you're getting like the five minute in each of these stops version, but we'll talk about some of the housewares. We'll talk about how things were bought on credit. So you could just send one of your children down the street to the store. They give your family name and pick up the supplies and then say at the end of the month, it's time to pay off your, um, your ledger, what you've run up over the course of the month there. 
and that was sort of how things were done. People, students are often fascinated in how the exchange of money worked back then. And so it's interesting to see how we're starting to buy things on credit in this period of time. All right. All right. All right. I think we should go for a walk. Yeah, yeah I think we've got enough time for one more stop. Yeah, one more stop. Does anybody have any questions just yet? We're gonna do our last stop for today of this tour and I'll tell you about what the other stops would have been if we did a full tour, but just let me know if you have any questions. So, yep, uh, Ms. Brian and Ms. Barb are gonna uh, head over, Mr. Brian and Ms. Barb are gonna head over to the <laughs> Um, and actually, while they're doing that, I'm going to show you our artifact cam. So what I would do um, in this case, as um, the educators are moving over to the next stop, I showcase this artifact. Can you all see that now on my screen? Just nod no. your head. Yeah. No? Beth, you cannot see it. Okay. But Amy, you can. I see the Mystic Seaport Museum sign. Is that what we're looking at, the orange sign? And then there, see my hand? There we go. There yeah. We go. Okay. Now we got it. So this is the artifact cam. So I've changed my camera to a different webcam we have set up here. And what we do is to, to get in some of the primary source analysis that often would be part of our uh, field trips anyway, uh, we actually do that. And it helps because it gives, it's the nice bridge for the educators who are on the grounds to be walking to the next stop. And, you know, it's fine if we keep the camera on, but, you know, it's also like, might as well do this too. And this is like a little clue for them too. We have, I have them analyze it. I ask them, you know, what do you see here? What does this look like to you? Do you are there any clues? Um, and so I'm wondering if you all have any idea what you think this actually is. Trying to move it up for you a little bit too. Please feel free in this case to unmute. You see the date on it? Going really down. It's like an eye chart test, I know, at the eye doctor. Um, but what, it, what, think, yeah. I was just gonna say, I think it looks like a textbook that you might use in the school. Exactly. This was it. And as you can see, this is Introduction to Geography. So this is an actual textbook. And then I would show the kids a couple more pages in terms of what they what they would be studying in the 1800s. And then, of course, I say, well, where do you think our educators are going to next? And most of the time they pick up that uh, pretty quickly they're going to the schoolhouse. So with that, I'm actually going to um, turn it back over to our educator, Brian and Miss Barb behind the camera. And they are at our historic schoolhouse. Before you do that, Sarah, can you yeah. tell us what year that book was written? Cause I could not oh, see the, 18, the year. Uh, 1847. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are here now in our one room schoolhouse. And um, we love to share with students the concept that back in this day, this would have been the single room that would have been provided schooling to an entire community. So if you have older brothers, younger sisters, any family members are right here in this room with you. The general layout is that you would have the boys on one side and the girls on another to reduce distraction. We would put the younger students in the front while the older students are a little bit more independent working in the back of the room. But we talk about the sort of subjects that students would have studied back then, things like spelling, arithmetic, geography, civics, how to be a good, a good citizen. Um, if we have a little bit of time in this space, we often like to bring in elements of a schoolhouse lesson we will occasionally ask the students to participate in a spelling bee or perhaps to do one of our recitations. And we've got written out on our chalkboard here uh, just a couple of things that would tie into school lessons of the day. So if you were learning your vowels, uh, that's B-A-B-E-B-I-B-O-B-U. Um, the chalkboards are kind of cool. And we've got a, a handheld a little bit of a, a slate here that a student might use to write on. I like to call this the 19th century tablet, um, but it really is, if you think about it, uh, with, a, with a crack in the screen, too, you know, just <laughs> like uh, all the others. But, so we, uh, yeah, we talk about the things that students would experience in this room. We often do a lot of question and answer in this space. Students are very curious to know how does recess work and uh, what time of day are you going to school? And, 
You know, do you have to go all year round? And in the same way that we have summer break now, these communities would have had times in the spring and fall for planting and harvesting where there would be breaks from school because there'd be so much work to do at home. So, yeah, we field a bunch of questions in here, a lot of the comparison of, you know, thinking back at the uh, back of the day. You can see it's not a very big room. There are only seven desks and a bench along the back wall. So certainly this schoolhouse would have served a very small community. Uh, the teacher would have been a young person herself, most likely a woman back in the day, and perhaps not much older than 17 years old. This was a very common profession for a young lady. And so she would be in charge of all the grades, which we always get the teachers commenting in the chat box. You know, if you could imagine having a, a six-year-old in the front row and a 12-year-old in the back row and you're juggling subjects and different kind of uh, grade levels. So it's, uh, it's interesting to think about what this space might have looked like if it was full. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brian and Barb. That was that was mm -hmm. fantastic. And now what we're going to do is we're going to actually transition. So Brian and Barb are going to turn off their camera um, and we're going to transition in a minute. Brian is going to get back to his computer um, to, to show you some of the astronomy versions. But before we do that, I'm going to be showing sharing another video clip because it just is an example of something that is a little more modern that we wouldn't have been able to do. So for the rest of a life in a seaport town, they would then go after the schoolhouse, they would go over, I would do the uh, artifact cam again, and we would show them a hook, um, actually, <laughs> we'd show them a, a hook that is made in our shipsmith. Then the next stop is our shipsmith, the blacksmith who made things for ships. And so we would talk a little bit about that as one of a 19th century trades in a maritime town. Um, and then after that, we this particular life in a seaport town actually ends at the Charles W. Morgan, which is uh, the last remaining wooden whaling vessel in the whole world. So we we actually have a our, our MiFi allows us for the most part, we still often get good connection even down below on the vessel. So we can show kids on deck and go down below. And actually, one of the things I'm going to show you this video now um, to to. This video was taken in 2014 when we actually took the Charles W. Morgan out to sea. And we did it a big voyage in New England, stopped at several different ports. And you're going to see this is amazing. It's GoPro footage of one of the deckhands climbing all the way to the top, which kids wouldn't have ever been able to do or see. So let me show you that. It's a, not too long of a, uh, of a clip. So this is the part two that um, we actually, there's not much by way of uh, scripting here. So we actually can talk while they're climbing and talking to the students a little bit about what she's actually doing. She's clipping in with her harness here um, and climbing very carefully over these different sections. She is climbing to what's called climbing over the top right now, which where you can see it's at an angle. And this particular part of the voyage, I believe they're at Stellwagen Bank near Provincetown, Massachusetts. Um, and it gives the students a sense of what it was actually like to be aloft on a whaling vessel while she is underway. It is a whole different thing than even being able to see the Morgan just docked next to us. Um, and even though they can come on the Morgan when they're here in person, it, obviously they wouldn't be able to climb aloft like this while she's underway. So this gives a sense of what it's like. When we show this video, we usually show this video during the whaling tour. Um, we get a lot of reaction in the chat from the kids. I don't know if anybody's in the heights, but this is, the, this is where it starts to get pretty dicey. But an incredible view. Flipping in here. Hmm. 
Okay, so she does continue up aloft and she actually ends up joining one of her colleagues up there and they actually set a sail when they're up there. And so we, we show that whole thing, um, which the footage is really, it's really a, a pretty incredible. Um, and so that's part of our whaling tour. So the whaling tours and the life in Seaport town tours, we say this to teachers, even in principals, even uh, if it's an in-person field trip, we can, we can tailor a program. If a teacher or principal just gets in touch with me and says, you know, I like that life in a seaport town, but I'd really like you to emphasize the whaling piece. Like we've done hybrids before, what I call a hybrid life in a seaport town and whaling. So there are ways that we can tailor, uh, tailor those programs as well. Um, so I am going to check with Brian. He, are you right next door now at your computer? I am. There he is. There he is. <laughs> oh, I'm okay. Uh, Let's see. I see Barb. I don't see you, Brian. Where are you? Oh, I'm on my own Zoom. I'm here. I swear. Yes. <laughs> find you. There you are. I'm gonna find you. Okay. Great. All right. So Brian is going to take it away. Um, All right. Super. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. Uh, so Sarah wanted me to kind of come on here and talk a little bit with you about our virtual astronomy programs. So um, these were some of the first ones that Sarah mentioned that we had to uh, cobble together very quickly after everything uh, shut down last spring. And so one of the things that we found out we needed to do, it was more out of necessity, was to create programs that were as interactive as possible, knowing fully well that the students, like me, were sitting around their homes and maybe didn't have access to advanced things like globes and other supplies that you might use to teach astronomy. So some of the very first things we worked on were the sort of things that you could do using very, very simple materials. For example, our very first virtual astronomy program was called Phases of the Moon. And I happen to have with me today all of the supplies that you would need for our interactive virtual phase of the moon. I've got a flashlight and I've got a little styrofoam ball that I have stuck onto a, pen, a pencil. Excuse me, I just bit my tongue. And so um, I have a real quick image to share with you. And we actually go through this activity together. But essentially what we do is we use the flashlight to represent the sun. We use the ball in your hand to represent the moon. And your eyes, your point of view is the point of view of the earth. And so while keeping the flashlight stationary, we can rotate our perspective and see the changing moon phases on the globe. This is actually a um, minimized version of something we used to do in schools. Maybe we'll get to do it again someday, where I would bring in a big industrial sized lamp and I would give each of the students their own styrofoam moon ball. And so that's just one example of how we incorporate basic household supplies into turning something a little bit interactive. Um, for middle school grades, when we get to, um, we've really tried to make these programs aligned with the next gen science standards. And so for middle school grades, they start talking a lot about scale and motion of objects in space. So we have a program called Scaling the Solar System, where we take a simple sheet of eight and a half by 11 paper, and we turn it into a 44 inch scale model of the solar system with each of the planets in their appropriate spot along the line. And so to help the students realize that the planets aren't evenly spaced like so many Google images of the solar system would have us believe. So we talk about scale of size, we talk about, you know, if Earth was a baseball, what other spheres that you're familiar with would the other planets be? And so we try to bring those, again, things you can say, okay, I'll be right back. I'm just going to run into the next room and grab that stuff. And then they're back and uh, back and hanging out with us. 
Of course, one of our favorite things to do here at the Seaport is to bring students into our dome and show them the stars. So we do have a standard virtual planetarium show called Night Sky Update. And this program, rather than being a slideshow about space, which would not be fun, this program uses a, um, an open source software called Stellarium. And this program allows me to change things like date and time and location. So right now we're set in Mystic, but if we were doing a program with students from Fairfield, we would move the night sky to your specific location. And so we would take the students on a tour of the night sky and of using some fun special effects. We would fill in our lines. We would paint some constellation artwork. We would talk about all sorts of things like how the really big stars have names. And if we look really closely, we'll see that some stars are red and others are blue. And we'll talk about what determines those properties of stars. Because it is a current night sky view, whatever the moon's phase is, whatever planets are visible in the sky that night, will co cover all of those. This uh, red object right here happens to be the planet Mars, which is the only planet in the night sky right now. Um, of course, some students are really into astronomy current events. So with the new Mars rover that landed last month, we'll often, one of my favorite things in this program is to go off on tangents because whatever burning questions are on the students' minds about outer space, I love this program going in all kinds of different directions. Um, yeah, so we will cover the entire night sky. I also will use this program, this computer program, in some of our other virtual programs. One of the original purposes of the planetarium at the Mystic Seaport Museum is to teach navigation. So we have programs that uh, rely on the use of grids to explain how sailors would measure the position of the stars. Um, there's a really great curriculum connection. You might be sitting there thinking, I'm not really sure if navigation ties in, but this is actually where the science meets the history because we have a program that is all about famous explorers and the tools they used. So we would actually take some items out of our little education collection here. What you see here is a, an angle measuring tool called a quadrant. This is a Christopher Columbus era navigation tool, uh, quite different from the much more modern sextant, which uh, ironically, I don't have one in arm's reach, but I would normally have one handy. And so in this program, after explaining the absolute basics of this instrument, the idea is, that if I measure something above my head, we see where the string and the weight are falling. And as I tilt down to the horizon, my string and my weight are now changing. And we can make this tool out of some very simple household objects. So this is my paper quadrant, paper clip, plastic straw, folded up piece of paper, and I can do the same thing. I can measure all the way up to 90 degrees, I can tilt it down to my horizon and measure something at zero. And so the paper quadrant is kind of another hands-on way in sort of a tactile way to learn a little bit about navigation. All right, Sarah, what am I forgetting? Well, actually, no, this is perfect because I realized there was one other sort of category of virtual field trips that because they're virtual, we have two special programs that we do with partner organizations. So one is called the Story of the Amistad. So Mystic Seaport Museum actually built the Amistad re replica here in the year 2000. We have her here. And the organization that is now running her is called Discovering Amistad. We have been doing tons of vir joint virtual Amistad programs where Brian or one of his other planetarium staff it's a joint program where Discovering Amistad talks about the story of the Amistad. Brian's team actually then talks about it from the navigation standpoint of getting up the coast. Um, and so we are just, we couldn't ever have done that in person because it's a lot mm -hmm. easier to collaborate virtually. The second program we do, we are very fortunate that we have a vessel here called the Gerda 3. Um, she uh, was a lighthouse tender, but she actually helped to rescue 300 
uh, Danish Jews during World War II. It, it's an incredible story. And so we have a joint virtual program about the Gerda Three with two other organizations, the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York and the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. So that's another one that uh, we, we do offer that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. We also have, um, uh, we have a role player and a shanty, a music program. So the role player program, I don't know if you've ever seen one of our costume role players. We have a, a Russian immigrant played by one of our fabulous educators who even like gets the kids up dancing, like teaches them a Russian dance. Um, so that that's actually translated fairly well virtually actually. And our shanty program surprisingly has also translated fairly well virtually because uh, it'll be one of us holding that um, iPad camera and that right on the shanty person and they will do the same program they would do but try to get the kids like standing up in their classroom and stomping their feet and singing. Um, so that has another been another one that translated very nicely. Um, now I'll go back to Brian and Barb and say what else am I forgetting <laughs> and we can open it up to questions now for sure. So I'm just wondering, um, because I was really fascinated, I don't think I've ever been in your planetarium to see your planetarium show, so I have to come back and do that. <laughs> but I'm just wondering how well that translates, because I'm fascinated where you can shift it into the town and look up at the sky, because I'm constantly, I live in Bristol, so I'm constantly looking up, trying to figure out, okay, so where is the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper and the whatever? And then um, the stories, like the legends that go behind the stars, do you do that as well? Ryan, talk we about your, your series. Yeah. Yes. So this is something, it's rel relatively new addition. So this past winter, we tried out with some of our, um, some of our museum members and our homeschool friends, we tried out a series of uh, astronomy programs about the star lore of other cultures. So the most commonly known one are the Greek and Roman stories. It's where you get Orion the hunter, Leo the lion, all those standard uh, issue guys. But we had the opportunity this winter to explore ancient Egyptian shapes. We talked about different Native American tribes here in the U.S. Uh, we went to ancient Maya, to the Chinese Song Dynasty. But even in a standard night sky update, we would go a little bit into the mythology of some of these stories. Uh, if you're familiar with the Greek and Roman mythology, you'll know that some of the stories aren't exactly appropriate for students. Uh, but we try to keep everything as family friendly as we can. And that is... Is, Rosie, to your point, one of the big advantages of the virtual program, for me to change the location in Stellarium, it's a click of a mouse. For me to do that in the Planetarium Dome, it's doable, but it requires a little bit more adjustment. So it's actually a nice advantage that we can, uh, Sarah, we've done night sky update programs for students in California. And so that's a pretty big shift in the night sky. And all I need are some very basic coordinates and we can personally Personalize that program quite a bit because yeah. I want the students to be able to see what's coming in their backyard. We want them to make that connection of saying, now that you've seen it on the screen, tonight you can go and see that same view. We actually have a couple of programs coming up with a school in Hawaii. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Polynesian piece. Yes. Good questions, other um, questions? How long is a typical program? And then I know you talked a lot about how um, they can be tailored. Does that include um, Brian's, all the astronomy programs too? Oh, yes. Yes. Brian is the king of tailoring. Um, <laughs> and so, yes. Absolutely. And uh, so the most, the majority, the big, greatest majority of our programs, uh, maritime history or planetarium are about 60 minutes. The, the, the life in a seaport town in whaling technically can be 75 minutes. They, they are if we do them to their full extent, but if a school says we only have 60 minutes, we just do a 60 minute version. And we, so we basically say, we, and we can do a 45 minute, we've done, we've done them in 45 minutes. So it tends to be that range, 45 to 60. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually speaking of tailoring, Brian did for uh, seventh graders, right? With Groton Middle School, I believe it was. Yes. Um, the, he did this, uh, great combo of scaling the solar system and Galileo. The footsteps of Galileo, yes. Galileo. Uh, so there are, you know, and we had a, a Zoom meeting with a, a, almost all the entire 
seventh grade teachers uh, mm -hmm. to talk about that. So we're, we're, we're happy to do that as well. To be clear, those programs were in the 75 minute block because we needed oh, yeah. a lot of time to squish two uh, subjects in. But yeah, we're, we're always happy to be as flexible as we can. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on programming for like the little guys? Oh, five to eight year olds kind of thing. Yeah. We have a couple, I'll mention them and then Brian will let you tell us. <laughs> well, the, we've got a really fun one for little ones called Sailor's Sea Chest. Um, and actually Barb, do you want to quickly talk about Sailor's Sea Chest? And then Brian, you can talk about the little planet, little ones for the mm -hmm. planetarium. Oh, Barb's fine again. All right. So I'm actually in one oh. of our other rooms Perfect. with the Sailor's Sea Chest. And what we do with this one is we start off by talking about why anybody in their right mind would go actually go out to sea, whether it was for fishing or exploring or just having fun. And then we start talking about, well, what exactly would a sailor be able to bring with them and how long would their voyages be? And as the kids start to tell us what was important to them to bring inside their own sea chest or their own suitcase as they're traveling, we start looking at the 19th century equipment equivalent to um, what kids would bring. Kids might bring iPads now. Well, sailors might bring a little bit of rope to entertain themselves. They could teach themselves not, teach each other knots, something fancy. Um, we talk a little bit about the kind of food that sailors would bring when they're out at sea, something delicious like hardtack or chip biscuit. So we've got a whole sea chest, a whole um, sea chest full of different artifacts that a sailor would bring out to sea with them. And it's just a wonderful way of weaving storytelling um, with what the kids would actually um, think about carrying with them in their own backpack. So that's a lot of fun to do in here. Perfect timing, Barb. Thanks for being near the sea chest. And then Brian has quite a, uh, probably two or three for little ones, right? Yes, we, we just, we're actually just adding and polishing our latest one. But um, I, as a uh, trained middle school and high school teacher, I actually really love working with younger students. I never thought mm -hmm. that's a, an area I'd enjoy as much as I do. But our first program that kind of dates back and it has an in the dome equivalent, we have a program called Zoo in the Sky which to go to Rosie's point about constellation mythology, we kind of look at the different animals in the sky. But the angle we take is the angle of imagination. So I love starting this program by showing students pictures of clouds. And I always ask them to tell me what they see here. And they always say things like an elephant. And I, I tend to play a little to play a little silly. And I say, oh, I, I don't think I see any elephants in this picture, guys. And then they tell me, no, no, it's in the clouds. So knowing that we can do that during the day, we can also do that at night. And so um, that one involves an interactive where I actually have students draw their favorite animal. We just draw a picture and then we take that animal and we turn that animal into stars. We redraw the animal, but with stars instead of lines. And that's kind of how we get their imagination going. Uh, again, to go back to the NGSS, because that is how we found uh, it's the best way to court our science classrooms. We have a new program for, for little ones, uh, kindergarten, first grade, that is called Patterns of Change because the first grade science curriculum is all about day and night and shadows and the observations we make. And so for that program, I'm just gonna give you a quick screenshot of our patterns of change. There's a number of different kind of almost games we play, but that program begins with a shadow tracing activity so that at the end of our activity, we'll go back and watch and how our shadows have moved. Yes. And obviously that's a little weather dependent. You can use flashlights as a substitute. Flashlights can be sneaky good uh, substitute sun, but we use both zoo in the sky and patterns of change as mm -hmm. um, sort of options for, for the younger students. Sarah mentioned we have, I believe nine virtual planetarium programs. Depending on what grade the students are, there's anywhere between two to five different subjects that would be really ideal for that age range. And we can scale things up and down. Our Explorers program is generally geared for younger folks, but if a high school class wants to go deeper into navigation, we will scale it up for sure. <laughs> 
And I forgot to tell tell you all about one other type of program for art classes. Um, we have there's a there's a, a traditional sailor's art called scrimshaw where they would they would do you know make make drawings on uh, whale teeth. And we have a version of that program where we mail little chips, not whales, whale teeth, but we mail these little chips. We mail like little packets to schools ahead of time, <laughs> excuse me. And so the Scrimshaw virtual program involves the educator not only talking about the history and what Scrimshaw is, but then physically doing Scrimshaw along with the students in the classroom. So they use, um, <laughs> Barb is our expert here. I think she has a, a day coming up where she's doing like two or three Scrimshaw programs in a row. And so it's a, a little, uh, I don't even have one, sorry, but a little uh, disc. We send along a paper clip. It seems weird, but you can unfold the paper clip and it becomes the sharp thing. Um, and then black crayon is kind of the ink. Um, so it doesn't get too messy. Um, so that's another type of uh, program that's more focused on art. Some awesome, awesome examples of things that you can do. I'm just wondering before, just because we're running out of time, but what's happening this summer and what um, kinds of things are you thinking about like for putting into place um, coming through spring, summer, and maybe even into the fall? And are you still planning to do virtual field trips in the fall? Oh, yes. And thank you for asking that because I did want to make sure people knew um, that we're really going to probably for the foreseeable future going to keep a hybrid model. I know that word is probably a bad word in school settings, hybrid, yuck, I know, sorry Beth. Um, but so we now luckily, because we ended up getting really good at our virtual programs, we're not gonna let them go. But you know, folks like Beth, if, if there's somebody far away who says, you know what, let's try it this year virtually. So we're gonna keep all the virtuals. Um, and we are currently, even currently now, we are doing on-site field trips as well. We've had a couple of schools reach out to us that are closer by that are coming. Some are doing self-guided and maybe a guided here and there. We have some scout groups who are coming and doing overnights. They're sleeping in tents on our green. Um, we are full on planning and registering summer camps right now. Um, and we hope that next fall, I think the balance will shift. So this, the high, more, higher percentage of virtual field trips this spring, much higher, <laughs> very rare to get it in person this spring. And then I think next fall, that's going to start to balance out, hopefully, where we'll get more on-site, in-person field trips, but we're definitely still doing virtual. And next winter and spring, we did tons of virtual programs in February this year, January and February. Um, and that's a time traditionally where schools would never be able to come to us because of the weather. And um, so that's another thing. If schools ever want to use it as a bridge and say, hey, how about in February we do like a virtual uh, program that's sort of a prep for when we come visit you in the spring or just you know, just do one and not, not both. So, so that we are definitely going to keep, keep both options. Yeah. And I think that's wonderful because, and I think that's one of the great things about the whole COVID pandemic. I know there's a lot of negatives, but I do think being able to now do some things virtual where we didn't even think about doing those before is a really great option. So thank you yeah. for being flexible like that. And I also want to just say thank you so much for taking us on this virtual tour of Mystic Seaport Museum. Um, as I said in the beginning, I'm always amazed at how much there is to see and do and learn. And I have to tell you, I was really impressed with the, the Charles Morgan going up and watching um, that view out at sea. I, I mean, I've been on the Charles Morgan before, but I would never have expected that's what it looked like. Um, so that, that was just an amazing thing for me to see today. So thank you. Um, I know it's great to be there in person, but I thoroughly enjoyed this virtual experience and I'm glad that you're going to continue the hybrid model so people have the option, especially if they're in the far western part of the state and it's difficult to get across the state in the daytime to um, tour. So again, thank you for all so much for highlighting um, these exhibits and um, being with us. I wanna just say thanks again to our partners, um, Justin's Horse Man, Liberty Bank, the Connecticut Army National Guard, Pullman and Cumley Connecticut Lighting Center and the Department of Health for helping to make this webinar possible along with the Mystic Seaport Museum crew. We thank you for your continuing support of our CAS professional development webinars and for all principals and educators in Connecticut. And again, a special thanks, Sarah, to you and Brian and Barb um, from Mystic Seaport to um, take us on this virtual field trip. It was wonderful and a great thing that we can do during the pandemic to stay safe and still enjoy Mystic Seaport and the museum. So again, this webinar has been recorded and, we'll, and it will be posted for future viewing on the CAS website. Please share the link with your colleagues once it's posted. And again, thank you all for joining us today. Stay safe, stay well, and go outside and enjoy the Connecticut sunshine.